Uh, Jonathan Rosen, thank you so much for your time. Really delighted to, to have you and have a converse, uh, have an opportunity to speak with you. Uh, you are a philosopher and also the co-founder and director of Perspectiva, which is a research organization in London that examines the relationship between systems, souls, and society. You are also the author of a book called The Moves That Matter, a chess master, a chess grandmaster, in fact, on the game of life, which came out in 2019. And you are indeed a chess grandmaster. You're a three-time Scottish chess champion. And then in 1999, you were awarded the title of Grand Master. By the way, uh, what does one have to do to earn that title? What are the, the credentials or what are the requirements for someone to become a grand, uh, a chess grandmaster? Mm -hmm. Well, first of all, it's I'm actually British, three times British champion, um, and uh, I think two times Scottish champion, if I'm not mistaken. But um, in terms of the uh, title, gosh, um, it's like this: you need to achieve a very high level consistently reflected in your rating which is like a, a golf handicap or a number that that people can quickly judge your your ability by and that number needs to be steady for a long time um, but you also need to have three exceptional performances which are called norms qualifying norms and they they tend to happen in quite big events where you have to play even better than a grandmaster to become one three times and while also holding a consistent level. So it shows the capacity both of enduring strength, but also kind of peak performance. And when you get those things together and they're all validated by the governing body called FIDE or the World Chess Federation, um, that's it, you've got the title and uh, it's a lifelong title. And uh, I think there's about, I forget the exact number, it's a moving feast, but it's, it's somewhere between sort of 1300, 1500, maybe even north of that now grandmasters in the world um, because it's a lifelong title and because more and more younger players are getting it uh, it's not quite the cachet it once was but it's still you know obviously something I'm proud of yeah congratulations and, and sorry I got my sources wrong there uh, with the, the British championship and the Scottish <laughs> okay. yeah, uh, I, only, championship. I, I only say that because when I was when it happened I was the first Scot for about 60 years to have won the title you know so a, you know it, it feels meaningful for me somehow Oh yeah, no, I, I completely understand. And as a, uh, a grandmaster, though, you basically you're saying you don't have to defend the title. Once you get that, you have it for a lifetime. But then you you play with other players who have to beat you in order for themselves to become grand. Yeah, it's not quite head to head. It's you. It's not so much that they have to beat you. It's that most grandmasters um, to, to to get that title, they have to excel themselves three times and what, I, what that really means in practice it will normally mean in the tournament you have to not lose many games and beat some really really good players so in that sense you're right um but it's not as though it's as it's as it, you have to defeat the actual players who have the grandmaster title necessarily you just have to make sure that you play as good as them or better uh in a, in a fairly structured kind of way um but I am, I'm, not, I'm kind of retired as a player. I mean, retired is a weird word, inactive, I prefer. Who knows when the second wind may kick in, but uh, for the time being, it's very much part of my past rather than my future. As a retired chess player, do you feel like you, you, you're getting worse? I mean, because you lack practice, is it a, a muscle that you have to flex in order to be super sharp and, and perform I mean, better? It pains me to say so, but almost certainly. I mean, I don't mm. know how, Badly, I would play. There's a limit to how far you can fall below your previous level, but I would, it, you know, it goes without saying. There is a there's a sort of general pool of strength and understanding that doesn't change. But there's definitely an edge, which is about your practice and your form, and there's no doubt that will be significantly reduced. So, uh, it would I'd guess it would take six months to a year to even have a chance of getting back to where I was uh, before I stopped playing. Let's talk about The Queen's Gambit, this spectacular, successful Netflix series, right? Really that, that popularized chess even more so than it had already been. Uh, what did you think of it? Did you like it? Uh, and how do you explain to yourself that it was so spectacularly successful? Okay, well, I, I loved it. I thought it was really well done. It, it, it spoke to me in terms of my own experience of growing as a young player, dealing with various personal issues through the game. Uh, and so it had a certain fidelity to the chess experience. In, and, and that was done through a lot of careful research 
It was also based on the author's understanding and the books that gave rise to the series. Um, but I think in terms of its success, it's really about two kinds of beauty. I mean, first of all, there is just the self-evident beauty of the main uh, actress, uh, Anya Taylor-Joy. It's been a while, but I think that's how you say her name. Um, but also the beauty of the game. And they're very different kinds of beauty. And the success of the series is really about the subtle relationship between the manifest beauty of a growing person, charismatic because they're brilliant at what they do, aided by wonderful decor and, and uh, fashion and dress and careful style and makeup and lighting and you know all of that. But then there's the, the geometric delights of chess, the beauty inside the game, the intellectual beauty, the beauty of the underlying mathematical form that gives rise to the right idea, which gives rise to the competitive context and so forth. Um, and I think it's this interplay of inner and outer beauty that most human beings intuit as something really important. You know, the aesthetics of life. We hear a lot about e the ethics, but a bit less about the aesthetics. I think there's something about orienting life towards the beautiful that is generally important and evocative. But I think during lockdown especially, and remember this came out during lockdown uh, or the pandemic, which has various degrees of lockdown, I think there was something elevating. Uh, the aesthetic quality of the inner and outer aspects of beauty were both elevating at a time when people's spirits were low. So it was good for morale. And the other thing is just that chess is kind of enchanting. There is this symbolic code. Um, the pieces do speak to you, even if you don't necessarily understand what, they, what they're saying. Um, and those, those factors together and a few more, I've written about this elsewhere. Um, just, I think it enchanted people. I think the, um, they, they felt, whatever that is, the depth of that game, and I write about this in the, in the book, of course, you know, chess is a kind of existential struggle. If you think about it, you're, you're trying to kill the opponent's king, but meanwhile, you're trying not to be killed yourself. So it's very much a simulation of death, right? And in the pandemic, that's what we're all encountering, more or less directly, more or less tragically, more or less personally, but death is in the position, it's in the game. And so the Queen's Gambit, I think, sublimated that feeling in the world outside, in this game that is very much an existential encounter with your own mortality, where you have to survive one move at a time. And people felt it, you know, that one move at a time is whether or not you're wearing a mask in the shop or, you know, whether or not you use your hand gel or whatever. Um, so it's something about the combination of the two kinds of beauty on the one hand, and the historical context set against the context of the series on the other. Oh, that's a fascinating explanation. I, I want to explore this notion of beauty in chess a, a bit further because on the surface, right? So you, as a layman, you look at chess and think of it as something that is very mathematical, logical, maybe brutally rational. Um, and chess is in fact often used as a, as a metaphor for cutthroat strategy and winning in, in business or in military. Uh, but you find beauty in it and you use the term beauty, not just meaning in terms of like an existential struggle, uh, winning and losing and death, life and death, but also beauty. Uh, can you explain what makes chess beautiful to you? Like per se or in certain moments during the game, what, what creates, what constitutes the beauty? Okay, so as I've indicated, there's the, there's the beauty of the form and then there's the beauty of the kind of underlying content or underlying uh, ideas. The form is, kind of goes without saying. It's it's black and white, it's chiaroscuro, it's the shapes of the pieces, it's the wood and all of that. But the much deeper beauty, um, it's something about the, the idea that there is a mathematical order underlying reality. Um, now, not to go too metaphysical too quickly, but I'm reminded of Ro the Rowan Williams, the former Archbishop of Canterbury, when he was asked for a quick definition of God he said, love and mathematics. That was his quick dis distillation. Now, that, that notion that you reach for mathematics to explain ultimate reality is also what, you know, the physicist Stephen Hawking called the mind of God. And he didn't, you know, he, he was maybe a bit more secular in his outlook, but there is this idea that somehow there's an underlying mathematical order. So in that sense, like you say, people see it as a mathematical pursuit. But when you relate to that order and commune with it and feel yourself in it, then it's altogether more experiential and relational and beguiling because you're kind of part of that order. And so when you're playing chess and you find an idea 
and your intellect chimes with the underlying logic that's on the board. And that underlying logic itself feels somehow perennial and deep and meaningful. There is a sense in which you're deeply alive. You come alive through the beauty because you feel that at its heart, there is a kind of order and design and underlying um, you know, depth and harmony and uh, aesthetic uh, delight um, residing not just in the game, but the game as a metaphor for life. I, I was reading your article in the New York Times a few years ago about, I think the title was, We Are Not Pursuing Happiness. And you were using chess and, and chess games as a metaphor, as the jumping off point to then reflect on whether or not we're pursuing happiness or something else, something that is sort of a je ne sais quoi, you know, something that can't be measured, can't be defined. And then you actually landed on joy. And I couldn't help reading the article. I kind of felt like, hmm. Is joy really what you wanted to, is that, is that the term that you wanted to use or were you forced into that by the editors? Because it almost like a little bit of a letdown. You know, I, I was following you with the happiness piece, uh, but then I, I was kind of thinking, ah, now it's joy. It's almost, like, it's, it's almost like disappointing that there's now another term rather than leaving it unnamed. So I was just curious about that particular piece and whether it is indeed joy that we're pursuing or whether that is just a, you know, a placeholder for, for, for anything else that we can't quite define, can't quite describe. Great question. So, I, so first of all, I think, I think the title, which of course is almost never chosen by the writer, is we don't actually want to be happy. And if I have a regret about my book, um, which is here, by the way, The Moves That Matter, is that I wanted to call it, I wanted to call the book, Happiness is Not the Most Important Thing. And that's actually the title of the last chapter. And the reason I came to that is because when I was sort of going deep inside and thinking about my chess career and my experience of all of these tournaments, all of these journeys to who knows where to encounter another opponent, to prepare another opening, to endure another middle game, get to another end game, win or lose or draw yet again. And then I looked at these, you know, tournaments and I stand back and think, who, what are these guys doing? You know, what, what is going on here? You see them mostly males hunched over the board Faces creased with tension, clearly disturbed, racked, um, tense, um, often anguished by defeat. And you think, you know, why put yourself through that? You know, are you, so are you doing it because the ultimate victory, when you when you succeed, you're actually happy at the end? Well, probably not, because we know from various studies that the pain of defeat is invariably greater than the joy of success. Not for everyone, I should say, but by and large it hurts much more to lose than it is joyful to, or happy to win. Um, so it became clear to me that whatever people were doing with chess, it couldn't reasonably be said that they were doing it to be happy. They were doing it for some other value, which is not to say it wasn't meaningful or purposeful or you know, useful in some way. Um, and it's not as though I, re I found joy as the only answer, but the way to understand the setup in that New York Times piece is that once you say we're not living for happiness, it begs the question of, well, what is it then? You know, what should we pursue? And the answer is, well, that's the whole fundamental philosophical question about being human and there's no quick answer. But, but joy is an altogether different kind of thing from happiness and it's, it helps to explain what chess tells us about life better. And the reason for that is that joy often arises from a kind of uh, deep encounter with something tragic or sad or difficult that's then relieved in some way. And I quote C.S. Lewis, I think, and I'm probably gonna mis misquote him here, but it's to do with um, the satisfaction of a longing, which is, like, which is itself a kind of dissatisfaction. And he, he speaks about the, when you feel that sense of almost divine dissatisfaction, that sense of things not quite being right. And yet when you tune into it, it's somehow closer to reality, it's, it's where things are at. When you get that experience, there is a kind of liberation, like, aha, it's not about this happiness malarkey. It's something altogether more complex and puzzling and deep. But then when you attune yourself to that, you feel, ah, that's my life, that's my struggle, that's what I have to endure. And it's all the more real and beautiful for that. So the essay, you know, packs it more tightly than that, but, um, it's not as though joy replaces happiness. It's not a, it's not a last minute substitute. Um, it's more that it helps to make sense of why people would play chess, why they would go through the struggle, the defeat, the pain, 
the tension. These are all sort of prerequisites for the experience of liberation in the form of joy. Let's talk about strategy. It's a strategy week at the House of Beautiful Business. And um, I'm wondering as a, as a chess player, when you start the games at the outset of a game, do you have a particular strategy in mind? I mean, is it all in your mind, you know, the, the next five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten moves? And then how often do you actually have to adapt uh, on the board in the, you know, in so, Yeah, so usually chess players prepare their opening phase of the game. So classically, the game has three main phases, opening, middle game, and end game. And uh, because of computer technology and the databases of millions of games that have been played before, and the body of knowledge that's built up around which lines are good and bad. There is this thing called opening theory that to become a good player, you kind of have to master. And if you don't master it, you'll struggle to get a good position at the start of the game. And much of the preparation at the highest levels is based on this sort of first, well, depends on who you ask. For beginners, maybe five moves, for club players, maybe 10. As you become more of an international player, 15 or 20. And then some of the very best players are studying lines much further than that. But usually when you sit down at the board, you cannot predict exactly what your opponent will do in, re in response to your, your own intention. And invariably they vary and do something else. So you need a sort of breadth of preparation. You cannot get what you want all the time. They won't fall into your trap. Um, so for that reason, there's a lot of adaptation that goes on. Um, and in effect, I, I think it was Artur Yusupov, a former Soviet grandmaster now living in Germany, um, who I think was number three in the world at one point. The way he put it to me when I was training with him is he said the most important thing about opening preparation is that when you come to the board, you have something to look forward to. Something to look forward to. I think that in some ways is the quintessence of strategy. It's as if you need to know where you're going or want to go, but you're kind of under no illusions that you won't get there. You know, but, but it sort of helps you to orient yourself to the struggle ahead and to be nimble enough to adapt if you have a sense of what you want. Um, that's about as far as I can answer it for now. I mean, it's not a strategy, but during the game, you often have moments of sort of reckoning where it's like, okay, that sequence has ended and now I have to reappraise what's going on. And those moments of inflection are inherently strategic, but usually it's, a handful of moves at the most ahead because there's so much that can happen. You're looking for the next transition, the next change of pawn structure, the, ne you know, the next set of pieces you want to exchange. Um, there are these little operations that have to happen for things to move in your direction, but it's almost never from one stage to the end of the game. It's usually how do I get to the, how do I transition this constellation to that constellation so that my evaluation slightly improves? Um, and that's the extent of the strategy usually. And once you get there, it's like, okay, now what's the new strategy? So it's a remarkable sentence when you, when you get back to the board, you, you, you want to have something to look forward to. <laughs> that's quite, uh, that's quite uh, compelling. Um, one, one last question for you, Jonathan. You also are the, the co-founder and director of a research organization called Perspectiva in which you examine how social change happens across systems so and soul is the curious one in, in, in the sum here, and society. Systems, souls, and society. How did the soul get in there? And what kind of work do you do with Perspectiva? Well, how did the soul get out in the first place, I suppose? I mean, there's a, there's a long answer here. I mean, I, I worked at the Royal Society of Arts for a number of years. That was my first proper job after being a chess player and doing a few different degrees and a PhD. I was sort of struggling to figure out, apart from playing chess and studying what I wanted to do, I found this job at the Royal Society of Arts, and that was a kind of public policy context. And I mention that now because it was a very rich intellectual environment. Lots of speakers coming in every week to sort of sell their books, and lots of, uh, you know, one of our, our colleagues were on sort of major news programs trying to make sense of their reports and get the ear of politicians to try and change policy. But in that environment, uh, there were boundaries to the discussion. There were certain places it felt like you couldn't go. So you could speak about well-being and people would go, oh, that's radical. You're not just speaking about economic growth, well-being. But then if you push that a little bit more, like what about flourishing? And when we say flourishing, you know, what exactly are we talking about? And what are the also, <laughs> Vishnu, I'm in the middle of an interview. But that is, that is the BBC moment, yeah. <laughs> moment. <laughs> I mean, no, you can't. That's no, awesome. no, no, you can't, you can't, just about, come here. 
No, no, no. Say bye, say bye, say bye. Bye. Bye, bye. bye. Nice meeting you. <laughs> Mama, wish you could come in the middle of an interview. <laughs> Yeah, this reminds me of this. You, you, you've probably seen this BBC interview as well. I have, yeah. I thought I, yeah, yeah, I yeah, it's amazing. off the door, but I told my, my wife to look after him. Anyway, um, where was I? So, yeah, in this environment, there were clear boundaries. And it was as if you could get to a certain level of meaning and purpose, but not beyond it. So if you asked, what, what does well-being consist of? they would sort of point to certain behavioral things, you know, quality of relationship and uh, life purpose and a certain amount of money and a certain amount of health and friendship and this kind of thing. But if you push that towards the ultimate ends of life, and then you asked about the kind of fabric of reality in which it exists, there was still this kind of default assumption, a kind of collective mental habit, as Owen Barfield calls it, of you could say a secular liberal imaginary in that environment. In other words, it was just taken as a given that a broadly atheistic worldview was the right one and that any discussion took place within that. And there might be in the private realm some religion and there might even be this new thing called spirituality, but that was not part of the discussion about how to build society. However, at the same time, I was doing work on climate change and I got a kind of, you could even say political awakening by looking at climate change because when you start to really understand, really try to understand this multi-dimensional global collective action problem in all of its aspects, political, economic, legal, psychological, sociological, technological, scientific, yada, 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 you can go on. But climate change is a, you know, hugely difficult subject. And when you look at it hard, you begin to realize that the underlying drivers are very hard to stop. The drivers of patterns of consumption, patterns of population, the, the drive for higher living standards. And it's daunting. It's actually very, very daunting and a little scary when you think about the apparent targets we have and just how hard they're going to be to achieve given all of our competing commitments. It's not as though we can't do it technically. It's that there's a huge gap between what Alistair McIntosh calls the politics and the physics. The physics say, yes, you can do this. The politics say, I don't see a way to do it. Now, in that context, what do you do? Well, you have to look at the prevailing assumptions about what life's for. You have to actually get very deep into what's the human being, what's the meaning and purpose of existence. And from there, you can't answer that axiomatically, but it has to be on the table. You know, to put it in secular business terms, if you want to talk about levels of economic growth that are viable and forms of green technology that will work or won't work, and you want to speak about a certain level of inequality, and you want to say, um, this is what the, the level of inequality between North and South will be, or anything of that nature. I'm saying, you know, cosmovision or metaphysics or the nature of reality is part of that discussion. Not because we can figure it out, but because when you're coming to possible solutions or possible options, you have to op keep open the question of maybe we're living in entirely the wrong way, right? So the reason the soul is in there is that I'm all for understanding complex systems and looking at things ecologically and economically and politically, and you have to see things as they function as complex adaptive systems. But you also have to take human interiority seriously because that's what kind of can potentially either recreate the world for, for in ways that don't help us or potentially transform it in ways that do. But to get to that interiority, you need a language of it. You need to rediscover the language of the soul, the language of myth, qualities of spiritual experience, the nature of transcendence, um, the capacity to live a, what Umberto, uh, uh, Roberto Manger Unger calls a larger life. How do you live a larger life, a life of soul? Now in that context, once you have the complex systems and the complexity of your inner lives, you also need better language forms, metaphors, practices in society that allow us to navigate that terrain. Now, if you ask me what this means on Monday at the business meeting when you decide what do we do next, I don't know. I just know that you have to find that mess. You know, that's the way to go. You have to go into that thorny, messy, troubled, vexed, but ultimately rewarding because it's, you know, scenario, because it's true to our natures. We mustn't forget our own interiority because 
through that is how we might build a new world. And that's why we speak about systems, souls, and society. Um, thank you so much for your time for this conversation. Really appreciate oh, it. Pleasure. pleasure.